In the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official, nearly 92 years after Lincoln's Secretary of State bought the territory from the Russian Tsar for $7 million. The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. The Bait Shack, located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They're the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Lawn Pro AK, your year-round professional property maintenance company, providing services such as weekly lawn maintenance, driveway sweeping, snow and ice management, and tons more. Get your free estimate today at LawnProAK.com. Anchortown Dogs, located at 4th Avenue across from the old 4th Avenue Theater. Look for the blue and gold umbrella. From reindeer dogs to bomb euros, they've got you covered. Anchortown Dogs, your local gourmet hot dog and sausage cart. Menegato's Accounting, locally owned and operated advisory and tax accounting solutions. Passion, experience, diligence. Learn more at menegatosaccounting.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off Arctic and 58th. Handcrafted Alaskan made cider. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Check them out at doubleshovelcider.com. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska, built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation. Find their products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce carts, and more at the Treehouse AK and other dispensaries around the state. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. TheTreehouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, your all-in-one cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be habit-forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older, keep out of the reach of children, and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services. Helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Caribou calls. Caribou calls. Uh, welcome to Alaska Wild Project, episode number twenty-nine. Uh, moose hunting. Uh, we have two very special guests with us today. We have the real John Lau, and we have Earl Stokes. Um, thanks for coming, guys. You bet. You bet. Thanks. Have to be here. Yeah, it's awesome that you guys came in. Well, free cider, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that that was the that was the the kicker there. <laughs> They seem to get a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we wanted to bring in uh, John and Earl to talk a, a little bit of history um, about their moose hunting and their moose hunting camp. As you guys have heard on some of our previous podcasts, um, I got invited to go with Jack to their their family moose camp that's uh, pretty revered and, and, and secret, of course, as most Alaskans hold their uh, moose spot close to their heart. Um, as most people say, your moose camp is up north by that one river. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's eight hours the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the Moose River. Yeah. It's moose on the river. Moose River. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Exactly. Cow Creek. It's in the woods. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of wanted to, to start with a little bit of history about your guys' moose camp. Um, as, as, as I had said on a previous podcast, going up to your guys' spot, um, I mean, I've been all over Alaska hunting and you know different stuff and i've never been to that area um it's it's i don't think that people r really go that way i don't i don't know why i just never really been to that certain area um it, it's a really cool spot i i really want to start off with the question is how did you guys come to to know about that area and i guess choose that area were you invited by somebody how did how, what's the history with that spot 
you bet I'm not going to go with that a little bit. I believe it was um, 30 years ago this year. Um, I had a workmate um, that took uh, another workmate and I and um, up to this spot. And um, he had been going up into that area since the 60s. And um, Jack came along, I believe he was 10 years old then. Oh, so yeah. It's, uh, it's been quite some time. And so... Uh, so what year is this? Uh, I'd, around? It'd be 91. 91? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so... Um, that's when I flipped that 125. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, Jack yeah. had a small Suzuki that just would pull wheelies right over your head. Uh, yeah. They're safer today. Yeah, the, one of the guys we had gone up with uh, had brought a buddy... And as soon as we got to camp, he's like, hey, you want to go up to the spotting hill? I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to get, to get a moose, you know. So this this guy, super awesome dude, um, was like, all right, follow me up. So it's steep hill. And right when we're getting to the the last climb, the, it wheelied on me. And I remember it as, like, I jumped off the back and caught the four-wheeler. I'm sure that's not how it happened, but that's how I remember it. And yeah. I'm holding the four-wheeler up while, while, you know, this other guy had gone up to the top. And then five minutes goes by when I'm holding the wheeler. And like I said, this is how I remember it. So this is how it happened. And, uh, and then I hear a, <laughs> and then, you know, about five or 10 minutes later, the dude walks down and he was like, Hey man, I just shot your moose. We, we weren't there. I was like, well, my four wheeler flipped. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that was like the first, right when we got there. Right. You bet. Yeah. yeah but, um, we had a good trip that year. We, we ended up, um, I don't remember there's probably six or seven of us. Uh, and um, we got a couple of moose and um, enjoyed a great place, beautiful place out there. And uh, so um, time marches on, and we, we um, over the years, went back, hunted, and uh, my workmate and I, that um, um, I generally would take the first maybe week or 10 days of the season for the, the history of things, and uh, he'd go up and take the last 10 days. He'd take the prime 10 days, and I'd, we'd um, take the first days. And Anyway, it um, went and started bringing up different folks there. Um, as um, Earl started coming up maybe about 15 years ago. Uh, about 15, about right? yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we had a camp there for uh, up until the last <coughs> couple of years, a couple of guys even older than Earl and I. They'd come on up, and uh, they would. They were retired. They'd set up the camp, and uh, we'd show up there and uh, just enjoy the benefit of the camp, the tents up for uh, cooking, woods cut, and all those type of things. And um, and they'd have ice for drinks. It was a good time. Yeah, they fill they'd up their pack own in water ice. bottle. They didn't, they didn't have Yeti coolers back then. Oh no, no just no. in the old igloo. Just a lot, a lot of ice and igloos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. These guys had a legit camp, you know, the the four of them plus their other buddies when they'd come in and out. But but the kind of Jim, like the one of the leaders, I guess, of the organizers. He, I mean, he would chop all the wood. He would fill the water. Like Earl has a story about not being able to fill the water jug. Well, Jim was pretty particular about how you did things. And one time, I went down to get water, and I came back and I lost the lid. I was never allowed again, right? So, like, not a bad thing. But. Yeah, it's like where you mess up your laundry the yeah. first time. Uh, uh, oh, I know that trick. <laughs> <laughs> Just turn one of your white blouse yeah. pink, and that's yeah. it. I yeah. never had to get water again. It was a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, when you guys first went there, did you go as deep in as you go now, or did you was the trail not as established that far in? Yeah, I. The trail was established, and we basically camped the same place that we're camping right now, where where you guys did mm -hmm. stop there for a couple of days when you're sheep hunting. So, um, but it has become more refined. When we first went in, there was maybe two of us to a four wheeler that may not have been four wheel drive, and we had pup tents and minimal uh, gear. Now we're um, we're really living the style with a nice cook tents and uh, cots and uh, coolers full of ice and lots Wood of ciders. stoves. And with, and so now life's good. So And probably better food than you had your first Oh, trip. man. The best thing that happened to uh, camping food was Jim. 
<laughs> it was like we didn't eat well camping and then dad met jim and then our our lives changed we went to this menu style where there's hors d'oeuvres and uh, yeah paired foods it, it, it's been amazing it seems like in a group of of adventurers or hunters there's always one guy that sometimes comes in and steps up the menu somehow oh yeah you know i yeah. remember <laughs> when i went with these guys on the Golcana the first time and I think all they brought was hot dogs and buns. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to eat hot dogs and buns. I mean, you guys might not know I own a couple hot dog stands downtown. That's the last thing I want <laughs> when I go out anywhere. I don't want to see a hot dog. And so that next year, I was like, guys, I'm going to be in charge of the food. We're not doing hot dogs and all that. And they're like, okay, whatever. And I think they kind of maybe yeah. got blown away a It was a, a game bit. changer. And even you even brought backup meals when, because the second year, I think, you didn't make all the meals, but we at least had a menu. And then uh, one of our buddies, Kyle, brought these steaks, but they were like, <laughs> he. I think he bought them on sale like two weeks before, and then left them in the fridge, and they were they're a little sour. <laughs> so in the middle of this meal, we're kind of like, oh man. And then uh, Daniel b busts out pork loins for everyone. So it was oh, like, oh yeah, all right. Yeah, he, oh, he was so excited too, man. He grilled them up. He's like, just sit back, guys. I'm gonna take care of this thing and. He brings me the first bite because I had brought the meals before, and he was like, oh, I'm going to impress this guy, you know? And he's like, here, Daniel, go ahead and take the first bite. <laughs> and I and I eat it, and I'm like, he's like, what do you think? I'm like, it tastes sour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what did he say? Oh, it must be the, must be the Thai chili, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Thai <laughs> seasoning I put on. And I was like, oh, I don't know. And then he kept passing it around to everyone else, and everyone's kind of like making the same face I did. And, and that was it. And I was yeah. like, all right, well, good thing I brought these pork lines. <laughs> That's the spice we would hide a sour, a sour taste in steak with, too. Yeah, we have the, the pork loins or one night. It's uh, the menu or is something that's developed over the years, and we come up with these favorites, and they seem to stay on there. So pork loins, one of them. And oh, we had tri tips with Santa Maria beans, steak tacos, yeah, those halibut, steak tacos salmon. Good. Yeah, salmon burgers, different bacon nights. wrapped, hollow, uh, pepper jack, halibut. Yeah. Oh, you guys yeah, are bringing real. seafood out there. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. we bring yeah, it. We got, if you're out there for two weeks, you got to you, know, you can't just go meat the, uh, the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Or there's what's well, Alaska? You know, you got to bring some sockeye. You got to bring some halibut. So. Yeah, we had ptarmigan this year too. Yeah, ptarmigan. And one night of moose tenderloin. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. It was definitely tasty. That was the good stuff. Yeah. We all, we had enough food. We should have just could have should have let it because stayed four more days. So yeah, you packed food out. He did. We did this year, but yeah. uh, it's because we ate moose a couple of nights, and um, uh, you know, luck. Last year we lucked out and didn't get a moose. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're able to eat all the food you brought yeah, in. Yeah. Last <laughs> last year was leisure, right, Larry Earl? Yeah, I kept asking John, "When's my day of leisure coming?" <laughs> I'm dropping too many moose. <laughs> Imagine bringing those trailers out full of moose, though, in that snow we got with that foot of snow that last morning last year. Yeah. It would have been brutal. We yeah. lucked out. Yeah. Yeah. Was that the first time that it snowed like that for you guys on your on your time in there? Well, you want to tell them about the time you shot it? And well, we did have one um, maybe about eight years ago. <clears throat> that, uh, it it kind of started out that day like this. We went out and had it in uh, – our, our buddy Wes, we got in at 11, he made 11 in the morning, he made us some heavy duty um, drinks there with some Bloody Marys. <laughs> and then there was another one. So well, we we're all out by one, just plain and simple. And so we slept till about four, and then we have a midday hangover. And, um, you know, don't let the women and children listen to this podcast. No, they don't. No, no women and sure. children listen to this. <laughs> anyway, so. Um, we ate dinner and it was starting to rain and I just said to uh, you know my, my stepson Matt and I go well you and I are gonna hunt so we went up there on the hill and as soon as we got off the machine there's a nice big bowl and um, so we we popped it and then it started snowing that was probably about eight o'clock at night seven eight yeah. You know. Coming and, down wet heavy. yeah and so by midnight I think we had eight to ten inches of heavy snow. Uh, enough where you couldn't find the trails out and 
uh, got back to camp and and um, Wes did, Wes was taking care of the camp and he I go Wes you did a good job of keeping the cook tent warm but did you notice all the tents that <laughs> collapse from the snow <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that that was um, you know the nice thing is it is it is fall and it's early and it all smelts and so oh, okay yeah is that the year you're off roaded off the off that plateau instead of following the trail where you get you and uh oh. jim got lost oh yeah coming out of the uh well <clears throat> where you killed the moose and it's a mile and a half from camp by mm-hmm. trail in sight from camp but it's all dark it's all snow and it's hard to see direction john takes off and that was before he had uh, a windshield on his uh on his uh, rhino. <laughs> so he filled up and packed the whole thing. They were packed in like cement. <laughs> and then Jim and I took off and we got totally turned around. You can't see anything. It's just snow and it's dark. Yeah. yeah. So it took us a while to get back to camp. I think we had, yeah. <laughs> that was a cold night. Yeah. Lots of pictures from that one too. But Then the next day we had uh, the wolf there, right? Yeah, wolf came right into camp and was trying to pull the, uh, we had the head with the horns on it in the back of the, of the, uh, the rhino and uh, Jim got up early and he's walking out and there's a wolf in camp <laughs> holding on to an ear trying to pull the head out of the and got away before he could get his gun out. Wild Alaska. Yeah, but then then you realize when all that snow's there, we get up the next morning and you're walking around camp and there's wolf tracks all around camp. And as as we were telling you earlier, the, it's amazing how many brown bear are where we are. I mean, there were tracks circling camp. They're out by the kill, and yeah, yeah all that, the things you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want to see. Good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, when you're yeah. not aware of it. Every, every everyone that hunted the next day in the snow said, "Boy, I had a grizzly near me." I tell you what, it's amazing how many uh, those guys are out there, and you just don't see them. So. Yeah, till that snow track reveals it. Yeah, just cruising about there. <laughs> Any other crazy bears? St- Maybe snatching the meat or anything like that? Well, I'll give you my bear story. All right, let's One hear One of about it. ten. But oh, Jack yeah. was in a few of them. It was, it was the first year we kind of resurrected a team to go back up there, so it was about 20 years ago. And um, we'd got to moose early, and um, we noticed quite a few um, grizzly bears, brown bears up there that year. And uh, I noticed they – we're paying attention to the cow calls i've gotten ears a few times well anyway i don't learn easy so the last night we're hunting um really didn't want another moose and i was just calling up on the hill cow call and i leaned my uh, gun against a, a spruce tree and 13 yards away i had a spotting scope to look to where i saw a moose down at the lake kind of the lake where jack spotted his here this year and I'd walk back and forth that evening calling. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, I walk over to the spotting scope. And again, my gun's back by that tree. And uh, I did a call over by the spotting scope. And I hear some footsteps behind me. I thought, oh, darn. There's a great big bull right behind me. I know this. And I look out behind me. There's, there's a grizzly bear right next to my rifle. <laughs> so... Um, there's two instincts, fight or flight. So, uh, I sprinted right for that gun and it was 13 yards and I, and I might've covered it in 0.75 <laughs> seconds. I don't know, but I was going right at my gun and the bear and that bear as I was going for my gun, he got up, stood up and he went, woof. He saw me coming and just got the hell out of there, which smart bear. He probably <laughs> thought I had rabies, you know? So that was, um, I did charge a grizzly bear. Yeah, <laughs> not advised though. No, no. Anyway, that was my that was my um, reaction to things. That's I figured that was the safest thing to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> that thing was coming right for you. Anyway, you. that's. But uh, yeah, the the bears up there really really stay away. Um, in all the years, we've never had a bear come into camp or surprisingly where we have the, the moose hung up near camp yeah, right across yeah 50 yards yeah yeah never had a bear problem with them no so, so never one try to snatch something down there not yeah. in that camp no no 
It's uh, and there's yeah. tracks all over. They can certainly smell it. Yeah, they, I'm certain they can smell our camp. We're not yeah. so pristine. And clean. Well, you saw the grizzly track right below camp, probably oh. fifty yards from the tent. Yeah, just this oh. last week when yeah. we were down there in the mud, right, right behind camp, right next to it. Yeah, you know, but they don't. Yeah, don't seem to come up and bother us. Yeah, although cow calling does seem to be a good way to get grizzly to come in because. <laughs> You've had it. Uh, Jim had it twice. I had it last year. Yep. Yeah. Where, you know, I, I, I do a lot of calling because that's what I like. And right about the time I'm ready for the, the go time when the bulls are going to show up, I hear something coming. I'm getting ready. And, again, it was a bear. But I, I never get to see this bear because it, it came in, and I would guess about 30 yards away. But then it stopped. And it was, like, right behind some, some spruce. And then it started woofing and, and stuff. So then you know it's a bear. So I'm trying to tell it to go away. And then it gets more aggressive. So I jump up on a on a stump. And then you're checking your gun. Did yeah. I load the <laughs> shell and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> and we had a standoff for like 15 minutes of him snapping and growling and me talking and trying to convince him that I'm a human. And finally I just kind of backed up and kept easing away and got out of there. But cow calling seems to be an effective way to bring in uh, grizzly. Really? I wonder if they think it's something that's injured or something, or they just know it's a cow. Yeah. They might have a calf around, I don't know, a younger, like a yearling. Or, yeah, I'm sure it's the uh, sound of it probably sounding like something in distress. I mean, my cow calls probably sound like something in distress. <laughs> <laughs> or horny. Yeah. <laughs> a little of both. Yeah. yeah so That's yeah. a good cow call. Yeah. Corey and I nicknamed Earl the... The Moose Whisperer. Moose Whisperer. Yeah. yeah. Never heard of that one. Yeah. That's good. Both of these guys are quite the callers. Yeah. Well, you guys are learning. So yeah. It's been fun. I don't think I've heard your your uh, oh, call quite well, yet. We can do some here in a little bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Get it going. I think Corey captured some of yeah. mine. Yeah. So that's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Corey has an awesome video of. Uh, of mm. uh, so, Corey, we hadn't, Corey's been coming up for, this is his fourth year with us. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. fourth year. And the last three years have been so warm that the moose didn't hit rut before we left. Yeah. So, I think um, the last night, the previous two years, we heard some, well, last last year we didn't, but the year before, we, we heard some grunts finally. Um, but we, basically, we couldn't, we couldn't get them going. They hadn't started grouping up yet. And then uh, this year... I don't know if it's a colder August or what. It wasn't really cold when we were there, but they definitely went into rut while we were there or started it. And they started. They, they're not. They weren't quite there yet, but yeah, they're grouping up. Yeah, they were grouping up and they're responding. So Corey went and hunted with Earl one night, and they kind of. You oh, can tell yeah. the story. Well, it, it, I guess uh, you know Corey's not had the experience of just having a bull come in when you're calling, so. We went up to the uh, the one site where actually the night before you guys saw a couple of small bulls sparring, so it was a good chance to get a get a bull in and and you never know if there's a bigger bull that was hiding back you know in the bushes waiting. So we went up there and and I kind of showed Corey what I've done and learned over the years up there, and uh, we got down to the point I said, okay, Corey, we're gonna get here. Here's the point where we change tactics and now we act like a bull. And if there's a bull in the area, it's going to come in within 5 to 15 minutes. And almost like on cue, you know, you can hear the gonking, plunking, whatever you want to call it, yeah. from across the way. And this, this nice, you know, 40, 40, mid-40 bull came in. Gave him a great experience because it came right down in and then it came right at us. And it was a lot of fun. And he got, you know, got the good experience of what it's like to call one in instead of spot and then going after it. Yeah. Do you find that the um, the cow call works the best versus raking or versus doing like a gluck call? So I have a whole sequence, and it's no secret. I mean, there's guys up here that have been up here a lot longer than me. So when I first started hunting with John, which you said 15 years ago, so half the time that you were there, I, I'm a bow hunter. Okay. So, and um, or, or you, the last couple of years I've used a rifle because my shoulders are just shot. But um, a trad bow hunter, yeah. trad. Oh, that's even next level. Well, because Jake and I go way back with trad and stuff, yeah. even all the way back to Georgia and Florida. Um, so, you know, you can't really spot a bull and go chase it down with a bow. I'm not that fast. So the thing is to try and call it in. So my first 
probably 10 years there, I just spent a lot of time calling and then kind of trial and error and learning, listening to John, the other guys there. Um, so when you're Chad bow hunting, it's totally different than when you're with a rifle hunter or a rifle hunting because you want something within 20, 25 yards. So it's a whole different ball game. But I got to learn kind of being close to probably 20, 30, 40 bulls, how to talk, what they're doing, how they react and stuff like that. So it's it's a combination of cow calling and then, you know, periodically with, you know, with the bone, it's a whole sequence of it. Is it is it something where when they're farther away, you do this and then as they get closer and maybe you want to be a little bit closer, like maybe he's at 50, but you want to come in within 30, then you do something different? So so for me, it depends on the day. I mean, time of day too. In the morning, you don't have time to set up that you're a cow, right? So it's mostly raking and, and, and doing bull calls. But in the evening, and John would laugh because I used to leave before dinner, and I'd get out there at like 4 o'clock, and I would cow call for three hours without even doing anything else, right? And, and again, I'm not doing anything different than probably hundreds of other guys that's learned this. But And then typically, you know, bulls wouldn't talk to us till 7.30, so I wouldn't even make a noise like I was a bull till after 7.30. And then you get that window from 7.30 to 8.30, and where we're at in the time, that if you're going to get a bull, it's going to be there. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's and, you know, cow calling is a sequence of you might do, you know, five to ten calls every 20 minutes or something like that and setting it up and moving around. And then, you know, around 7.30, I would start, I would move off 50 yards and act like a bull that's come in for those cows, and that's when the other bulls come in. So, uh, and, and it, and, yeah. It seems like well, the way that Earl and, and Dad both like to call, it, they're calling, like, tactically. So they, they've already set themselves up in a place where they believe that there's bulls in the nearby area mm -hmm. and they're not when the, at least in this kind of operation that earl's talking about you're you're like not trying to call a bull across the valley what a lot of times would happen is i would go to the same spot for three or four days so anything that was across the valley would hopefully show up next day day after right so it's amazing how many times there's nothing the first two days and then the next two days are a lot of fun. Or we've chased maybe six legal bulls at a time in a certain small area after we've called there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So. And and then sometimes you call and call and uh, nobody's home. That's the way it goes. Yeah. So, but, but in the mornings, you know, I, I do a lot of raking because then you're just trying to get, because you haven't set up any kind of cow calls and you're just trying to get a quick response. See if something's already right around there. Yeah, and yeah. that works. I, I we've come across a lot of bulls with just a quick rake. And what do you like to use to rake? I've seen all kind of different whatever's things that people left use. over from camp last year <coughs> yeah. with, the, with the scapulas, right? Yeah. We, oh, okay. One of the old ones use. of the the old yeah. uh, antlers there. Well, not antlers, but the uh, shoulder. Like, oh, yeah. the shoulder. Oh, scapula. okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're easy to carry around. Uh, um, a full paddle from another moose is kind of heavy, so we take the scapulas and and we use caribou scapula because they're they fit in a pocket and they yeah. work fine. Yeah, yeah. Except for dad, dad likes to carry around this like <laughs> megaphone, <laughs> a big so old bull moose scapula, so baritone, baritone. Yeah, there it is. That's how they get the yeah. big ones. It's I just nice figure one. that scares the other ones away, so yeah. I just use the little ones so they know they're coming in. And the two together sound a lot like antlers together, and then one on branches is like scraping and raking, so they work really good. And then um, the other thing they work good for is signaling a bull. You know, it's like, oh, I got, you know, here's the horns so you can flash them. That's amazing how that works, too. You just flash them, they come, they get excited. Yeah. So it works both, yeah. Works for cover. Now, and, and back to the history of starting with the, um, when you guys started at your spot there, have you seen an influx of other hunters come in over the years, or has it been mostly the same guys that have been going in there? It, in, in this particular valley, it's pretty much been the same guys. Uh, others will come along. Um, like I mentioned, we, we usually go in early, and so uh, a lot of the other hunters and uh, the mass of hunters aren't coming up yet because they're not in rut. So... Even though we may not have as good as uh, hunting, 
as the the second group that comes in there during the rut, we usually have really a great isolation. We may see one other person back there in the whole entire week. And so um, I I don't think there's any more than there was, but um, you did go in there, Daniel, and uh, it is hard to get in there. It's a lot of work to get in. And um, um, we don't think that the trail ought to be improved too much because it'll bring in more people. So it's... um, Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, the harder the trail maybe makes it more difficult for people... Man, want to open that door so he can come back in unless he knows the code there. I gave him the code. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, well, that's good. That's good that a lot of people aren't coming in there. Now, what 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 would your feelings be if you see some new group come in there that just maybe randomly <laughs> came in there and set up? I mean, you're going to go have a chat with them? or It it, it may have somewhat happened a couple of years ago. They were in camp one day, and some young guys come in and go, gosh, um, we're going to go down the river a long ways. And the thing is, you can only go down about a mile, and that's the end of it. Um, and they, they came on in. They, they actually sat up about 600 yards from us and uh, um, kind of had a talk with them. It says, you know, you guys, I mean, it's all right to come in and hunt, but you are camped right where we do hunt the moose. Um, yeah. I mean, you kind of need to respect that. And so... Uh, um, I haven't seen them, but there is another group that is coming in this year, and it, it was obvious they want to probably hunt that same camp. I'm not sure if they're um, associated. And they were nice and respectful. We talked about it a little bit, and um, um, gave I gave them some good options where, uh, I mean, uh, if we camp in that spot because we're all set up, but there's other good places to hunt. So I yeah. gave some other suggestions where I'd seen people take moose out of there and uh, got just as good a chance. So, um, yeah, and we saw a legal moose on the way out really, really, really close to where they had camped. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so they they definitely could have taken a moose yeah. there. Yeah, definitely was probably within, uh, you know, 500, 800 yards of where their, their tent was set up. Um, they were gone when we left, but there was a, a nice bowl as we left. And uh, yeah. now somehow in the years when we don't get a moose, those bowls don't hang out no. by the trail on the way out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would have been the easiest moose of all time. Well, you know, I asked that because um, we went on our float hunt, and and it was our second time that my brother and I went on this on this creek to go on this hunt, and we had uh, three spots picked out, you know, and we got to the first spot, and there was nobody there, and, and so we felt we were lucky, and, and we, we saw four other groups come by, and one of the other groups literally went like one bend where we could see from our, from our vantage point that they literally just went around the corner, and we thought that maybe that this was like their previous spot. Cause this is only our second time there and they pulled in there and obviously they were kind of bummed that we were in that spot. You could tell cause we're looking at them and they pull out and they kind of go on the next bend and they're walking around debating on if they should camp there, you know? And so I started talking to my brother. I was like, man, I would never go where there's somebody else. Like if there's someone there, I would go, a lot further yeah. down the way at least you're not in, in the space. immediate area yeah. i mean it's a hundred so miles on this river there's plenty of other spots mm-hmm. you know and so they did they moved on and then we actually got you know taken out of our second spot that we wanted to go and somebody was there but we didn't even think twice to keep going you know we're not going to pull into these guys spot so I, i'm always curious on how different people approach you know, someone coming in to a spot you've been going to, whereas the river, it's a little bit different. I mean, there's, there could be maybe a few good spots that have vantage points is that you could climb mm-hmm. that you kind of pick out, or maybe there's a couple of creeks that come in so that you want to choose one of those areas. And if you can't get to that first spot, you have a couple other spots in mind. So I was curious on what people f- feel or what their reaction is to someone coming into a spot that you've obviously been going to for a long time, you know? Yeah. This thing, the last couple of years was the first time that really ever happened. So, uh, um, you know, there's more people, everybody's got the right to go out and hunt. Um, I think 
people need just respect and say, hey, let's let's have some distance. Um, I, you know, I can't say should it be a mile or two miles, but basically, um, um, if the, if folks are camped in there, go go over the hill. Yeah, so you so, can't be seen at least looking yeah. at each other all yeah. day. Well, it was yeah. like where these guys camped. You could see their camp from our tent, yeah. and it was exactly where we hunt. We could so, hear them calling. Yeah, we could hear them calling from camp. It, it was extremely rude, yeah. and I, I just couldn't believe it. And when they came by, it was like, hey, there's all these other spots out here. You know, There's a lot of trail, and there's a lot of places people aren't camping. So why don't you try that one? And then we actually ran into him because I went out a day earlier than you guys that year. And they'd come out in the parking lot. And I was like, I went up and was like thanking him. Yeah. And, and Corey, Corey was like, I don't, I don't think that they're um, actually leaving. And so I went back and I was like, so you're not leaving? And they're, oh, no, we're here to get another buddy. And, but I was thanking him for giving them a space, you know, because yeah. they were right in the middle of our hunting area. I think like the night before I was on a bull and um if we would have shot the bull um we would have been shooting within 300 yards of their tent at their like the exact direction of their tent yeah which i mean that that could be dangerous obviously if they don't see it and and you do from your better vantage point yeah yeah, that's a that's a tricky um that's a tricky road there if you want to grab another one just go ahead there's plenty of caribou calls there um, actually, why don't we take a quick moment and give a shout out to some of the sponsors here real quick. Um, I want to give a shout to uh, Tailored Restoration, 24-hour emergency services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold damage, post-emergency cleaning, remodeling, and the aftermath. Burst pipes, overflowing toilets, downed trees, fires, pet accidents, uh, roof leaks. Tailored has an emergency response number with trained professionals available to help you any time, day, or night. Give them a call in Anchorage at 344-1239. Matt Sue is 373-1239. Or the best place to uh, get some info from those guys is at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Serrano's Mexican Grill, my personal go-to for authentic Mexican food. It's Anchorage's own new generation of cocina. It's our go-to on Canning Day at Double Shovel. All recipes are inspired by rich heritage and family know-how. All ingredients are made in-house. They have a bomb new tequila bar. I always get the mescalita, highly recommended. Locations on Tudor and Northern Lights. Follow their food truck location on Instagram. And check out their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. The Treehouse AK, your one-stop dispensary located at 341 Boniface Parkway. Be sure to ask the bud tender about their deal of the day because, honestly, there's always something good on deck. And, guys, listen, this is where the culture lives. At the Treehouse, their dedication to servicing consumers has been developed through a lifetime of involvement in the cannabis culture. They're committed to providing the highest quality products at whatever value your budget affords while always maintaining the deep-rooted principles that have carried them this far. Their focus is on relationships over transactions, and you can always depend on them to treat you with the respect you deserve. Hit them up at thetreehouseak.com, and remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. So up at camp, um, you know, a lot of times I'm doing um, these hunts with Daniel and and some of my other friends that uh, we've been following, kind of like all these people that are making more progressive outdoor gear. And one of the comments I frequently get from both of you guys is your clothing's too loud, you know? And so then I'm getting like the Cabela's, um, quiet rain gear that I'm borrowing from you. You Um, what are like, what, what's some gear tips for us? You know, (laughs) like what, 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 what gear is important at moose camp? You've seen my gear and you're asking that. (laughs) (laughs) It's quiet. (laughs) Well, you know, being a bow hunter for 50 some years, um, it it was always more, I was always more concerned about quiet than, um, than anything. Right. Um, I've, I've gone through a lot of gear. I mean, you see what I wear most of the time now it's a flannel shirt Yeah, and I, I wear a lot of, um, what you would call like skiing pants for like cross country skiers, right? Because they're nice and tight because they're not catching on brush and they're just made of like a stretch fabric. Right. So it's it's not like I'm buying a lot of expensive, you know, gear from Kiwi or whatever, yeah. right? Um, 
You're not queued out? <laughs> no, I, I do have some of their gear. They make great gear. Yeah. Um, but not any, none of their gear, although I saw your pants this year, were, were looked pretty good. Yeah, those were um, all right. But most of their gear is not made for quiet. No. I mean, it's sheep hunting, right? You're, yep. you're, you're um, not typically trying to walk through uh, alders or bushes and stuff. But for me, the number one thing has to be the gear. The clothing has to be quiet. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I have some old Sport Hill. They made them for a couple of years, brown, you know, just ski pants, and they work great. Um, and flannel shirts, um, stuff that's just not going to rub or anything like that because, you know, you go in there with a pair of Carhartts or something, and, and Corey was walking around behind me this year with some car, and I told him, go home and change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Because I'm, I'm – you know, long time bow hunter. Plus, I I have very bad eyesight. I'm blind in one eye, so most of my hunting is by by sound. So you know, it's always been about being quiet and being able to hear and stuff like that. Yeah. Have you seen? Um, obviously, you know, thirty, forty years of hunting, the progression of gear that you've taken out there, like maybe the quality of tents or sleeping bags, increase a lot, or do you kind of feel it's a lot of fluff that marketing? Well, I'm gonna. Go from what Earl said there. Flannel shirts. I'm I'm kind of into Pendleton wool, and um, I think I've wore a Pendleton wool shirt hunting forever. If somebody gives me a nice, brand new one for Christmas, that doesn't matter. It it gets bloody. Yeah, it goes hunting, and so that's that's um, one of the problems on the noise and all that is it's the rain gear that's always the problem. But otherwise, if it's a dry day. You can go down to uh, any of the sporting good places and not get high end. You can get some really inexpensive um, pants, and you you know why right away if you scrape them with your fingernails or whatever, whether they're not going to make noise or not. So, um, when it comes to quiet hunting, I don't think I've got anything uh, in the last ten years that I didn't have thirty years ago. Uh, now, that's on the dry days, but. Um, you got to go watch out because you do want to hunt on the wet days and there is some stuff that's, you know, kind of nappy on the outside, but it does attract moisture. Uh, you might stay dry, but it gets heavy too. So. Yeah. So as far as rain gear, is it more rubber style, you know, Heli Hansen, or are you going for some of the other stuff that has a, uh, it, different on a, material? On a pouring down rain day, there's nothing that beats a Heli Hansen, right? Yeah. yeah. A long one that you can sit on and stay dry, but there's a lot of really nice new stuff out there. Um, guaranteed. Um, I just won't pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I've gotten by for, you know, however many years with, with what I have and. Well, what we usually do is if it's um, raining hard or all, we usually just uh, stay in the cook tent and uh, drink cider and read books. Yep. I mean, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, if it's pouring hard, it's you're, yeah. you're not. there's and, nothing moving anyway, right? Yeah. Well, it, it might be moving, but as a bow hunter, you're not um, – with rifle hunting, you could hit a moose and, you know, it's shock and it drops. If you're bow hunting, you know, it's it's bleeding it out. Right, so you got to have a blood trail. Oh, so okay. if it's raining, it's gonna wash. Why it out. should I hunt? Because I can't find what I hit. Right, it's typically not gonna drop within fifty yards. Even if you double lung it, it's gonna bleed out. It's gonna go a couple hundred yards, and if you can't trail it, so if it's raining as a bow hunter, I just look at it as not ethical to go out and try and shoot something. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot yeah. of the really bad weather, I sit out. And the conditions are against you when you're calling, too. I mean, yeah. they're not moving around. Your sound doesn't go as far. Yeah. So, so I, you know, a lot of it's choice. But as far as gear, I mean, there's a lot of great gear out there. Um, a lot of improvements. I mean, uh-huh. you know, from water, water filtration to sleeping bags and, and uh, pads. Good boots. Um, and we're sleeping in a, uh, an Arctic oven now. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not, nice. Yeah, that's got, really nice. Yeah. Buddy heaters. The buddy heater, right? So it's <laughs> yeah. not bad for us old guys yeah. to get up yeah. and turn And we argue who's going to turn on the heater, right? And yeah. The other thing about <laughs> our moose Paper camp, scissors. It's, I mean, we have a nice camp. We have a wood stove. We have a wall tent. You know, uh, so you can dry out gear. We bring hangers from home. And uh, so the gear that, the ring gear that 
dad uses and some Jim used, um, and I just use their gear too because they have tons of these sets sitting around out there. They usually, there's usually multiple sets, um, and it's usually the Cabela's. You know, maybe it has like a Gore-Tex layer in it, but the outside is kind of like cotton, mm-hmm. and it it gets soaked. It's um, happy. Yeah, yeah, it gets wet, but it's way quieter than any other rain gear, and uh, and you just try it out that day. So you go hunt in the morning. The moose aren't really moving around much during the day. So you come in, dry it out, read a book, and then get back out in the evening and maybe put on a different set. But it's definitely not ring gear that like we have. Yeah, no, it wasn't always that way. It was um, we when we went up and stayed in small tents and got wet. It, you had wet gear for the whole week as if it kept raining. That's just the way it went. But, yeah, I've done a lot of yeah few sheep hunts like that yeah you never drive for 12 days right daniel yeah. and i had that sheep hunt this year yeah yeah, yeah. You know. that's just part of the yeah. suffering that you got to endure to to get after it yeah, yeah. the winds of the shack I, I was actually surprised when we went out and and uh we helped set up that that wall tent actually i have a quite do we even do that thing right yeah um, <laughs> well, you change something the, the front door is now the back door but it's pretty cool because now uh, we never looked out the back. We opened up that way, and that was pretty cool. We had a view from uh, the wood stove. But so. I think you guys probably set it up so it was um, never so secure. You had enough ropes. It was a bomb out. shelter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it wasn't going to blow away uh-uh. when yeah. you transitioned. Yeah. Jack Jack was on that thing. He's like, this thing's not going anywhere. We're, yeah. He's got oh. contraptions and. and blocks and all yeah. kind of ropes I had going. video proof uh, all kinds of <laughs> stuff i was not gonna get blamed for this thing falling down but then one of our one of the you know, guy wires came down well it, we looked when we got up there and, and i see moose tracks just running right along the tent and pulled a few guide wires oh, out maybe you hit their foot on there <laughs> yeah, or something yeah. they just run their whole body through there right? yeah so he lost a few on the now moose. what about where the uh where the the, the stove jack goes out I, that was the one thing that we couldn't figure out where because we didn't see a hole anywhere where it should go out. And so what, what did we do wrong there? I think we didn't even put it up because we didn't know what to do there. You, you didn't do anything wrong. I, I, the, uh, you put up a new wall there. There was an older wall, uh, pieces for that that had more of a cutout. And so um, when Renoro and I got up, we just cut a section about, you know, whatever it is, I might be 18 by 18 out of there. Then put in the flashing and uh, and um, rebuilt the stovepipe. It's uh, uh, that stovepipe might be ten years old, so we brought up some new stovepipe and um, um, hopefully it's good for five years. Otherwise, so we rebuilt it again. But you guys did great. Yeah, so, okay, that good. was a good setup. We were it was all- nice to come in there and have it set up. <laughs> yeah, we should do that again next year, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. I'm down. <laughs> yeah, we will yeah. set it up. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, on the uh, secret on the plan A, saw eight ramps. On plan A. Plan A? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So none of them are legal, but for on the trip, I yeah. was uh, so from that little hump that you went back and looked to look back in there. I stopped there and look up on the hill, and there's eight rams, and then I was looking at them, and then I heard, Pow, and then none of them roll. It's like, man, someone shoot at those? Pow. Then they run up. They're looking down on something, so I thought someone just missed them, and we ended up running into those guys, and they shot a um, cinnamon black bear right below the sheep oh so i thought they were shooting at the sheep yeah and, but they didn't look legal so i was kind of worried yeah but uh yeah anyway i thought i mentioned that one more question about the uh the wall tent we slept in the wall tent which was amazing compared to the little two man that we ended up bringing and i asked jack i said oh this is really nice that you guys all sleep in this thing and it's plenty of room and he said that you guys don't sleep in that that you set up your little tent on the outside and i was like what well why there's well, so much room in that thing like it's you not guys really have, a tent that we sleep in i mean like i said we we got an arctic oven now yeah it's 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 more of a a cook it's the cook tent we get the stove going in there we set up tables um and it's, you know when you do have rainy days and everybody's in there in a the chair it gets pretty crowded yeah it actually does so on average there's what four of you normally our our, our weeks are four four yeah two and john yeah. and i were there for half a week before yeah the other two guys came in, but then we leave, and the other, they, I think yeah. they had four or six coming I in. I think they had six. The so the second trip. group uses the same wall tent? Yeah. And then they put it down and take they, it They and take, take it care. down and carry it out, and then 
yeah. and then you guys yeah so next set year when you guys go sheep hunting you're also going to have a wall tent to set up now yep. that your experience with the uh now that we well, did that one got, pretty good that's right yeah. <laughs> we'll give you we'll step you up you, you <laughs> earned it yeah what's what's the arctic oven that you got is it a nun attack or whatever do you know it's uh yellow <laughs> <laughs> it's it's from you know the fairbanks group or something like that. okay so, you know the those things are good. badass man those things are amazing everything but the entryway where it's like flat square roof yeah well, that, that's a bad design but it, it's yeah. not set up for rain it's set up for snow i think that's yeah, uh, yeah. it seems to collapse but so it, the vestibule section has like a square top and so it just pools rain Oh, really? Right there, yeah. But it has some posts that I think are, or, you know, kind of. Um, like a rib or something? That yeah, that's that's supposed to be loaded, but there's been some rips and stuff. So oh, it's not okay. Like it used to be. So. Could right. be operator error, too. Yeah. 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 Frequently yeah. find it doesn't that. doesn't come with case. instructions. We're guessing, right? Yeah. yeah. And you guys go buddy heater versus a stove that goes in, it, in that thing. Oh, yeah. So. It, we don't need a. I, I've been out with that same exact tent um, back about. 10 or 15 years ago doing a bison hunt on the far wall burn there when it was like 30 below and it comes you know and you have one of those uh arctic ovens with that little stove and it could be 30 below out there and you get that little stove going and you're sitting there in shorts and a t-shirt but it's not 30 below up there we're a yeah. cold night yeah. for us is 30 yeah it's uh it's just nice to take the chill off in the evening if you want to go and uh, yeah. read or something when you go to sleep and then uh, when you get dressed in the morning otherwise it's it's no big deal it's it's just great um um i think the arctic oven's probably about 10 degrees warmer than the cabela's tent something like that so yeah yeah those cabela's guide tents are are pretty legit and that little buddy heater really really oh, warms yeah. it up yeah. i was out on the caribou hunt when i went um with chad and i got that little cow and there was another guy out there who had just bought one of those brand new arctic ovens and he had the fancy stove and he had his wife and his two daughters out there. I was like, okay, well, that's probably the tent you want to bring out there with your two little, you know, under five year old girls and your wife. And, uh, man, he had this stove in there, which I thought it was a typical little wood stove, but it's not. They have like a propane one now oh. that you can set like to the exact temperature yeah. that you want it on there yeah. with the timer, Bluetooth, <laughs> all this. I'm like, geez, they're going next level with this yeah, thing. They are. I've never experienced that. We've always had wood. Yeah, on the like I said, we were out there minus thirty, and it was warm inside. Those things are great for really cold weather. The yeah. first guy gets dropped off with the chainsaw. Yep, that's right. The first guy gets dropped off with the chainsaw, sets up the tent, starts cutting. The other guy comes in and yeah, <laughs> starts burning wood. Yeah, in <laughs> shorts, sandals. Well, what I like about the wood stove or in the cook tent is um, we cook everything on it. I mean, the only thing. We cook on uh, the propane stoves, coffee in the morning. Mm -hmm. But I, I tell you what, you got that big top there. You can be cooking two or three dishes at once. If you want high temperature, you kind of put it to the back. Um, gosh, it's pretty gourmet for us. Yeah. I, I had a question. You guys had that Dutch oven um, deal, that big pot thing. Do you put that direct? Is that going in the fire? Or you put that directly onto that wood stove? Get, kind of both. Um, you Depends. know, you can go and put it over somewhat into the coals of the fire, and then we'll put baked potatoes in there and whatnot. Um, you can also put it on top of the stove. Um, I know last year we didn't make any baked potatoes. This year it was all fried with bacon and onions. <laughs> I, just, I heard you're a fried chicken man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I so, got a recipe for you. Yeah, you do. So, uh, you know, you can put it on top of there, but um, and and bake your potatoes in there too. Yeah. Now, yeah. when you cook the steak, um, do you put it directly on on that flat powder on the top, or do you put a, like a cast iron pan on there and then cook the steak on there or the pork loin or whatever? So, so our steak cooking is is on another. We build the fire outside. Okay. And then we have a tripod with. With a oh, chain to grill. Oh, with the grill. little uh, grill yeah. thing on that. Yeah. Oh, and that okay. makes the best steaks. Yeah, the yeah. steaks, yeah. Uh, chicken wings. Oh yeah, the chicken wings on halibut. Uh, you know the, the halibut hors d'oeuvres. Yeah, that's a great little thing. At yeah, that thing is, and you can raise that up and down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, depending on the heat, pretty easily. Yeah, that one's solid. Yeah, we cook tri tips. 
uh, the tenderloins. The tenderloins. Steaks, we yep. had stuff for the flank steak for the uh, steak taco. Yeah, all yep. that goes right over the fire. Yeah, Earl has some bombs. You'll steak have to tacos. send me some of those pictures so I can embed them in the video yeah, yeah. version I think, of that thing. Did you see the one that I had earlier up there? Yeah, I saw the one that you had some tenderloin up there. Pull that up real quick. That yeah. looked, that looked hungry. I I think, was that the yet. loose tenderloin? Well, I, forget. Well, I think I think it's probably the tri tip there. It's uh, yeah, we. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. This is the tri tip. No, oh no, yeah. No, oh, that's no. perfect. Look at that. Yeah, that tri tip is legit. Ooh, cooked just right too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, rough it, rough it. yeah, we're roughing it. Oh, so the stick. Yeah, we should talk about the stick thing incident after we're done cooking. I now, do you guys designate right like uh when whenever I go with my brother, I'm not a breakfast guy, so he's always the guy who cooks breakfast and I always do the dinner. Is there a designated dinner guy or you guys alternate or how, how do you work that out? It, it kind of, whoever gets back to camp can start breakfast, but um, for this year anyway, um, uh, sometimes we have pancakes, but we're really busy this year for some reason. We got moose, too many too moose. Many, too many moose. So every day was um, bacon, <laughs> onions, fried potatoes, and some eggs. Um, somehow we make it all the way back there, Daniel, with uh, five dozen eggs unbroken. Yeah. Oh, the Costco one that's already ready yeah. to go? Yeah, yeah that thing works pretty it. good. It, yeah. It yeah. travels it's great. Yeah. That, so, that actually works really, really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Kind of embed that in some tarps, and uh, it just what a what a deluxe thing to have fresh eggs back there, you know. And it, and anybody is eligible to cut potatoes and onions. So yeah. yeah. Yep. So and then <laughs> there, there's favorite uh, people, you know, like and we didn't get around to them this year, but Jack he's been bringing up the uh, salmon burgers. Um, and salmon and whatever it is are all made some uh, steak tacos. Um, I, I do my favorite dishes. and um, Yeah. Yeah, you kind of own your favorite dish. It just happens that I only bring one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Earl only brings one, so Dad ends up. He, he has lots job. of favorite dishes. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. our favorite dishes that John makes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah, exactly yeah. right. Like, hey, let's, John, let's take yeah. that one off the menu. For <laughs> that's our favorite. That's yeah. our favorite. Yeah. Keep Spaghetti. doing that, John. Good yeah. job. That's <laughs> real good. Yeah. Spaghetti night is always a favorite no matter where you're at. You know, you can't beat spaghetti. That's oh, yeah. The spaghetti night was good this year. Yeah, we needed another uh, caribou, but since they closed the, usually we cook the caribou Italian sausage in it, but we had a store bought because they closed Unit 13 on us before we got home from sheep hunting. Yeah, yeah. Well, before you guys came, Earl and I had um, caribou tenderloin from last year. So Ooh, yeah, just, that was yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Was that from the one day trip with us, Jerry yeah. and I? Yeah. yeah, awesome. Do you ever see any caribou by the by the camp there? No, no not that they, they winter in there. So. They do. Okay, yeah, so but not I, during when you guys are there. All those trails you see coming through there are caribou, but we never see. I see way more sheep. Bears and yeah, wolves. I think the first I might be the only one that's seen caribou. The two that we saw when I was telling these guys they had never seen any. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. There's uh, you can tell there's a lot of caribou because the uh, it's kind of the killing fields. The mo- I'm uh, the wolves, mm. you know, they, there's caribou bones everywhere. Yeah, we find how many sheds. And oh, it's not so much sheds, but skeletons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Antlers, right? down below camp, you'll just walk down there and they're just. You know, um, skeleton after skeleton, and they're usually cows and um, and calves and whatnot. I think the bulls stick to the mountain tops there in the winter time too, because that's where you find their sheds. So yeah. yeah, yeah, we did find some sheep this year down there too. Yeah, I've seen um, quite a few sheep down there. Yeah. The wolves, there's a lot of wolves. Back yeah, there. tons of wolves. Yeah. Many packs. Yeah, we saw a wolf this year. Yeah, and Corey looked down. And he's like, "Holy shit!" And this is like, like three hundred eighty yards away. He's like, Man, "Is that an albino moose?" Because this wolf was so big. Yeah, and I was like, "Nope, that's a wolf." Yeah, it was a, it was a big sucker. But uh, even out, you know, I think it was like three hundred fifty yards or something. It, it hurt us or winded us or whatever. It didn't stick around. It was yeah. out. It was at the gut pile, and it was yeah. three hundred eighty yards. Yeah, that was a big. The grizzly on the gut pile too. Oh yeah, that's uh, one morning there is uh, looking up from camp, and it's I think uh, right about a mile up there, but uh, we could see the gut pile from camp looking up there, and there's a nice big heavy grizz there, and um, well you know 
gonna everybody is uh, anybody that wanted to shoot a grizzly was occupied hunting moose that morning so um we didn't nobody went up to try and get him but yeah but you're not opposed if someone's wants one to, to take one off that moose pile no uh, we went what is it three years ago we got two no five years ago six you gotta lose track of time um he shot almost the first day and I shot one the second day, so then we have another eight days of doing, yeah, <laughs> not yeah. moose hunting, right? Yeah, drinking cider. Yeah, <laughs> so, a lot of good food to eat. Yeah, we drank cider the first day, and then we got the idea that um, we're going to go visit his gut pile to see if there's any any uh, wolves or bears on it. Yeah. So it was a morning. And where he had shot his moose is what we call the high blueberries, right? The stuff that's over your head. Okay, yeah. You know, yep. brushy, you can't see more than about five yards. And it's raining. Mm-hmm, uh-huh. foggy. And he doesn't have any covers on his scope. He's old school, right? You just wa- wipe it off on your flannel before you start shooting. There's another way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we go, okay, let's, let's, let's kind of sneak in to the uh, cup pile like you can really sneak in and in blueberries <laughs> over your head but we're going into it to see if there's anything in there and when we get about 50 yards away and you know the birds get up and we start hearing noise and and uh, we get about 40 yards away and it's a pretty angry grizzly and it's snapping and growling and making a lot of noise so we kind of separate a little bit and uh, we get into about 30 yards of it and um you know by that time you know 30 yards of grizzly covers in no time so it's kind of ridiculous because i can't shoot that fast i'm a bow hunter yeah um but also he shoots right so i kind of jump out of my shoes and i hear the bear come off and just i can hear it for 80 yards just you know huffing at every jump and everything and then it just got quiet so we, we walk in further there, and the bear had, you know when they bury their kill? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, they got a mound that's like five or six feet tall. And the bear must have been on top of that mound. And he saw the head and just, like, dropped this sight from the head to shoot, you know, center in the chest. Mm-hmm. But the bear was standing up there just looking at him sideways, and he shot right through the, we figured, right through the front of it. Yeah, it had never, to been just, uh, I see this head. That's all I can see <laughs> in the, a very foggy scope. And it was mad, and I just kind of figured, okay, there's the head. I'm going to come down and get a vertebrae <laughs> here. But I think it was looking at me sideways. So, and uh, he got off clean. We got off a of clean, and we didn't have to skin in. It was a great day. I think you probably had a little bias on that shot. Yeah. <laughs> From which point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so the Kodiak brown bear that we got, <laughs> yeah. it, it stood up over the alders and was we were, you know, we're in this thick alders, no one can see it, anything, and dad jumps on this snow pile. You want to tell the story? Always just kind of the same shot. There's, uh, um, we're on the grills, and Jack was, and, and my buddy there close by, and all of a sudden I see this head pop up, and I did the same thing. Here's the head. I'm going to come down right below the jaw, yeah. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. And it did get it. And it was standing. I, I thought I had the same shot, but it had to be on the, uh, looking from the side at me and uh, like i said um we didn't have to skin a bear and we had to chase it for a while which was just to make sure looking for blood because blood, yeah. i we didn't hear after about 80 yards it just went quiet so i thought maybe it piled yeah you know, it piled like, up so yeah yeah no but we didn't have to skin a bear we haven't had to skin a bear back there yet well the except for bears, the black bears yeah, that yeah. we eat yeah, the, yeah. The, the black bears back there that have been that have been eating the blueberries. It's amazing to go and um, gut them. And you go, how come everything's purple here? And God, they're good to eat. That's, yeah, that's uh, I I, I kind of I never hunted a bear. I've been on lots of bear hunts, but my personal view is if there's one I'm going to shoot is going to be a blueberry one up in a mountain that I'm going to want to eat. That's you right. Know? Yeah. And that's just my personal. Nothing against guys that get out there and get after them bears, but that's just my personal. Uh, philosophy there and it kind of gives me a i don't know like a spiritual feeling like i'm not gonna mess with them they're not gonna mess with me you know because i don't i'm not the bear hunter guy good, good bear karma yeah yeah i think so I don't traditional know if that's true. bow hunting for bear though you'd like that because that's putting it one-on-one yeah that sounds scary 
Well, I haven't. I'm not. I don't have the cojones to go after the brown bears yet. With the that that, that, that takes a different level of. But I've black bear and I with Jack's, um, not Jack, Jake's dad. Um, a couple, I don't know, probably ten years ago, fifteen years ago, the last black bear I shot with him it was like four yards. Four? <laughs> yeah. So, oh wow! You know, walking the salmon stream and stuff. Like you that. use your hand and poke them? Just about. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, you're you're just kind of sneaking along. And yeah. So yeah, so it's a lot more fun with a traditional bow going after bear to me. Um, I had a I had a note written down here on moose uh, moose numbers. Um, so what what would you say in the thirty years? You, would you say that they've been relative relatively steady? Less, more. I, I, I think the numbers um, in the last ten years there's fewer, and the wolves have uh, obviously increased a lot. Um, I, I know, um, uh, you know, when we came in there, I can just pick say twenty years ago. I know that well, there was probably eight or ten bulls in our valley, and probably, you know, twenty or thirty cows. Might have been 50 cows. I don't know. This year, there's probably three or four bulls in our valley, and maybe, um, you know, I can't put a number on cows. Let's say there's six, eight cows so far, but they really hadn't started grouping up. But I do think in the last 10 years, uh, we're all, I mean, you've been up there 15, would you? In, in our area, there's been fewer. Yeah. And way more wolves. That's the main attribute there is the wolves. And it might just be the area we're at where we're, you know, there might have been guys trapping there 20, 30 years ago, and trapping's kind of maybe dying out a little bit, and the trappers aren't back there. So there's, I mean, we're sitting there at camp first night, and we hear a wolf back down, you know, south of us and one up north of us and a couple across the way. Mm-hmm. So, so multiple packs so multiple in there running around. There. Yeah. 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 And they're yeah. big packs. I yeah. mean, when they start going off, there's probably 15 or 20 wolves in the pack. Oh, yeah. wow. They're, they're big packs. They gotta eat. They gotta yeah. eat. So and we and we find all the dead bones. From, yeah, yeah, everywhere. I mean, yeah. You can't go on one of these game trails and walk 500 yards without seeing multiple kills. You you, you find a lot. Yeah. Um, and so last year we counted them. We saw 20 cows last year. A lot of them are repeat cows. Yeah. You know. Um, but what was important about that? It wasn't until the 20th cow that we saw a calf. And I didn't see, but I think I saw six cows this year, and I didn't see a calf. We saw a couple. You did? Corey yeah. and I did, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't see a calf this year. But, but also, the you know, it could be the, I mean, bears eat a lot of wolf. I mean, uh, calves. just calves. Yeah. 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 So and, and there's a lot of bears back there, and we haven't shot any in a while. So. No, there's a lot of grizzlies and a lot of wolves, and um, it's so. – uh, it, we get a moose most years. A couple of times we didn't. Um, somewhere around four or five years ago, we only saw two cows in like eight or ten days there. And at that point, I go, wow, this is this is significant. But you know, it's 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 not really that much about the killing. It's really about going out and uh, the fire, sitting around. And uh, and the views and enjoying nature and if we look out and get a moose, cool. If we don't, Cooler. that's cool too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cooler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first Less one, work. The first one we got was just John and I, and you know we're not young, and we're not totally healthy. <sighs> I mean, as far as just beat up our bodies, right? Some knees and yeah, hips knees and, and hips and shoulders and stuff. So you know that first moose was a lot of work for for us. Yeah. So when, when Jack dropped his moose and there were two 40-year-old, you know, something-year-olds right there <laughs> lifting the hindquarters, oh, that was like heaven for us. You should have heard the joy in their voice. And they <laughs> talked about this a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, isn't this so nice? This is so great. <laughs> and it's like, boys, all right, or Corey were just like, yeah, this is normal. We're just carrying this weight. You, know? <laughs> you just don't understand until you get, you know, until they, you hurt. They were able to, like, you know, hold the legs while you're doing a little skinning. Or yeah. Pulling. It's like so much. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we we may debate next year. We passed up a few legal bulls before we shot the one. Yeah, so. the first morning <laughs> there was one right near camp, and uh, went down, looked at it, and it was actually probably bigger than any of the ones we got. And I go, well, why would I ever do this? <laughs> um, the young guys aren't here. 
Who wants uh, to start working yeah, on day yeah. one? So we got to, <laughs> and it goes Bass Earl. He kind of thinks the same thing there. So yeah, and it just it, it just happened that uh, it was exactly thirty years before a moose walked right into your scope on the spotting hill. Well, that. Jack, that might have had something to do with it because I've been up at that spotting hill uh, many, many times, and they go, "Where? How come one hasn't walked out here again?" And uh, <laughs> finally, we get up to the spotting hill, and we were not going to hunt. We were going to go up, and uh, we had a couple big uh, tumblers full of maybe some whiskey and ice, and we're going to just scope it out. But this guy was out there, and then we watched him on the scope. Uh, I'm not really sure why we really wanted to shoot him, but we did. So, yeah, yeah, then it was work. Yeah, God. Yeah, when you sent me that text, I was like, "What?" They, I, I thought that was a bold move not to wait for us. We were all plans were just to spot and figure out where the bulls were hanging and stuff, and then he walked right past us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> do you we, have a, um, a chance. do you have a rule that uh you won't shoot one that you can't ride the wheeler to is there a certain yardage that you're like there's unwilling? no place i don't think that you can't ride a wheeler to so that okay. stuff is out the window i i think the guy to ask that question to passed away two years ago but um he would go out and shoot one where i would go i saw a bull back way down there i'm sure it's legal but I'm not going to do that to my friends. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, where'd Jim go? Uh, blue hat moving around through the bushes. Then you hear a boom. Well, now we got to go get it. So um, we've been in some, we've always been able to get the wheelers there. Yeah. But I won't say it's been easy or or safe. That's yeah. Right. That, yeah, that <laughs> safe part. So I, I think Earl and I are pretty conservative on it. Um, it's got to be pretty close. Um, it's just not that important. Yeah. You know? Um, just not that important to get the moose to go and take risk and uh, all that. So, and they move around. So yeah. it's like if if they're over there, you know, let's wait till tomorrow and see where it's at the next day. Or well, know, that's another um, moose. Let's see if we can call it. Get the, it closer, the one right? Jack spotted. Um, yeah, about a week ago, whatever it was, or um, Thursday. Uh, no, yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday. So, yeah. So um, it was. He goes, boy, we can go there. Can I go there? Yeah. I, and I'm going, I hope we never go there. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of work. But um, I did, um, you yeah, know. So way down into that. Yeah. This, the, the, I think you can see the moose yeah. in this thing. Yeah, yeah I see uh, these two right here. Um, yeah, up there on the yeah, yeah. There, yeah. So, you know, it was probably two and a half miles from camp and about probably a mile and a half from a trail and all that. But uh, uh, I did know that it was going to continue up that valley because they always do mm -hmm. and they get on a ridge and uh watched them for years and i figured it's going to be up near us in the morning but we went up and looked for it and um, didn't see it yeah so it was it was kind of cool so this particular day dad and i we we left our valley and went to a kind of like a side valley that we've seen moose in before and we hiked up and so this picture is taken at like 7:45 at night it gets dark about 8 30 but the civilian twilight's probably like 8 30 at the time and so we're up there in the valley was that we were hunting was dry and uh <clears throat> i don't know we we're like a mile from the four wheelers or something and then dad's just like i'm not seeing a sign it's dry we've been calling we haven't heard anything like let's rip back and get up to that spotting hill and see if we can find something so we get up there and i spotted these two bulls at the far left side of the me uh, meadow. So another 300 yards up and they were just kind of chilling. Um, but then dad started calling from there. And so we're a mile and a half away here. And every time he would call that the big bull specifically would look up at us, hold it right on a gaze, like looking exactly at us for five minutes. And then it would start tromping our direction and then he'd call again and it would start uh scrap scraping his antlers in the just in the brush like little tiny bushes in that marsh and then it just continued our way and so the last time we saw it was just our direction from where i showed you where those moose are where that those two ponds are mm -hmm. it was there so we're still looking like a mile and a half from camp and it's getting dark so then we cruise back to camp and then we came up with a game plan 
Um, so dad, dad had a good idea that dad and we would go up here and try to sp- locate the bulls in the morning, thinking that they had moved up, um, but they could still have been over there. Who knows? And um, and then uh, Earl and Corey went would go the other direction in the creek, just looking for other other bulls. Um, so we got up here and had no luck. You know, didn't see it and didn't locate anything. Um, to the right of this, it's super thick forest. Um, and then, uh, what what did you experience that morning, Earl? Well, so Corey and I, I'm I'm kind of lame. I got a bad knee, so I'm, I'm like. I'll hang around camp. You guys can go, you know, after them and stuff. So Corey and I were going to go drop down to the bottom and, and uh, right behind camp. And we, we dropped down there. That's where we saw the uh, grizzly tracks, I mean, 50 yards from camp. And I told Corey, I said, well, let's just cut through along here because that would put us out towards a direction where those moose somewhat were headed. You know, they're still two miles away. And uh, we started walking through there, and I would just, you know, occasionally just kind of, uh, you know, rub. Um, kind of, you know, antler, and um, we heard something, and it was pretty loud. But when you're in the, you know, in the woods like that, you know, I told Corey, I said, you know, both of us said, okay, it came from that direction. I said it's either within a hundred yards or it's a mile away. It's, you know, it's it's kind of weird because it was so loud, but it didn't seem close. And we kept walking that way for half a mile or something, and didn't hear it again. So then I thought, well, maybe it's. You know, Jack and John up there just taking two big antlers and clashing them because that's what it sounded like. And uh, so we walked through a while, and I told Corey, I said, "Well, let's just let's just jump up this ridge because um, mm. we were down kind of in a in a ravine. We jump up on this ridge, and we'll uh, you know see if we can hear anything." So we we get up there, and, and I'm trying to climb up. I'm much slower than Corey. He's up at the top. I get up there, and he goes, "Did you hear that? That was all." And I'm like, "No, I was kind of breathing hard." So we get up there, and uh, we, I said, well, let's just continue that direction. So as we get, I don't know, another 200 yards further, we hear a lot of heavy clashing. And I'm like, okay, that's some bulls fighting, so we got to go fast. You know, and every time they're fighting, we get to run. So we, we we got pretty close, and I could hear them. And then, uh, so then uh, I, uh, I uh, said, oh, there's a little hump right here. Let's just jump up there. We get up there and the bulls are fighting right below us. Oh, so, wow. but there was two of them. One was good size. Um, you know, I'm telling Corey, "Don't shoot, don't shoot," because I can't tell how big. Finally, it turns around. I see how big, and I tell him to shoot. And then I'm like, right away, "Don't shoot," because then they light up side to side. So, yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Jack and I were up on the hill, and we just um, not much was happening up there. I got so, a I got a question. Um, as far as judging how big, if you're if you're in a fifty inch area, what is like a tip that you could give to a new moose hunter on how to judge if you believe a moose is fifty inches or bigger? I I'd say um, have them look at a fifty inch moose horns a lot. I, I don't know what else to say. Or, or really the most important thing is go and wait and find four brow tines until you know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just a mistake that's made by too many people right off where um, you get buck fever. Gosh, that's got to be big enough, and you end up getting a 45 yeah. or something like that. So I'd say early on, unless you have seen quite a few bulls over the years, um, count for – three or four brow tines, um, depending on the area. And they do have, just tips for hunters, is uh, a range finder that has a width on it that shows where 50 inches is at maybe 100 yards. Hmm. So, um, Yeah, that's like the Leopold Trophy. Yeah. Yeah. That for, so for me, I mean, we, we grew up moose hunting, so it's been more natural. But there's a huge difference between looking at moose horns in person and looking at them in a photo. And yeah. you should not be using a photo. And the second thing is there's a huge difference between looking at moose horns on a dead moose that's hanging on someone's shed and a real moose walking around. So we'll then we'll, we'll continue the story now. Um, so at that point, I, I came down from the spotting hill 
uh, with my four wheeler and uh, it pushed those moose back down towards that meadow and then uh, these guys Corey, Corey and Earl walked back around met me um, Earl uh, needed my four wheeler so he took that which is probably a good idea seeing that my uh, four wheeler had scared him away and uh, instead of heading back down to this meadow uh, like deer do sometimes moose do they backed around circled back around and they these moose uh, started coming up a cut but unbeknownst to me and uh, so Corey came with me for backup and uh, we're we're listening for uh, some horns and we start hearing them fighting again and uh, man they were a lot closer than we thought they would be and uh, so I had all my loud shit on so uh, I like I felt like a little kid, like I was eight, and I was handing Corey my gun and handing him my Bido harness and, like, quietly taking off, you know, the the down Koyu jacket, which is loud, you yeah. know, yeah. and uh, finally get all my stuff, uh, my loud stuff off, and uh, I set it on the ground, and we start creeping up again, and I had all my quiet John Lau stuff on. And uh, so we get we get pretty close to this cut, and we can hear them fighting. And then suddenly, uh, man, they're they're so close to us that you can hear their horns rubbing in the underbrush of spruce tip of spruce branches. So where they were was in this tiny little cut. It's probably I don't know, ten yards ac- across, um, and probably sitting down a well, it's sitting down about a moose head height. And uh, the only way I can see him is just ducking. We can see him by ducking down and see, looking under the spruce tips. And we see these horns just kind of walking through the brush about 25 yards from us. And uh, it's kind of hard to tell which moose is which and uh, and how big moose are when they're in this thick undergrowth. But uh, it ends up um, coming out on the other side after about 20 minutes of staring down and being quiet. And I uh, had some beautiful views of the, the moose it was almost like it was like dusk because we're in this thick kind of forest and then looking at the moose the moose that ended up taking um for 10 or 15 minutes with its head under a spruce tree um just behind a spruce tree and uh it anyway it took a step out it was the right one could tell that it was way bigger than 50 and it was the one i had been looking at the night before that dad had called our our direction and uh yeah we took him he, he dropped right there and it ended up being a damn good spot to take him and a uh, real clean spot did you do the ankle shot so you don't lose any meat <laughs> <laughs> I, I was li- i was thinking about a neck shot for a minute but it's been a while since i since i had taken a big bull moose so uh, i ended up taking him a, a, a nice like i was above him so kind of like through the spine and into the lungs kind of shot um didn't want one little bullet hole through the back strap and we didn't really lose much m- moose meat yeah and uh then you of course you like run right up on him and you're like man i hope this thing's 50 <laughs> you know it's like oh yeah he's he's 20, 50. <laughs> well it's probably the same deal when when earl was in here we were talking about that that ram that we found on the on the sh- um brooks range is like you never know until you walk up to that thing and actually yeah. take a look at it i mean your heart's pounding you're like man is this probably the same feeling like is this thing 50 you know you got your probably have your measuring tape in uh-huh. your pocket you know and that's the first thing you do yeah you know or you count the rings right away and yeah. like oh and then you're like okay whew, good <sighs> that's good yeah. yeah i mean we had the thing under glass for hours uh-huh. yeah and you're still you know you get on it and, and you could tell it was the same bull because every most you look at the 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 antler configuration is unique yeah, mm-hmm. and once you had it on the glass for a long time, it, it's funny how you can actually tell that's the same bull. Yeah, you were looking at the day before, or two weeks ago, whatever. You, you we kind of even name them, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. by the by the horn configuration. Yep, yeah. This one had like a trifecta. So um, that morning before we left, I was like, I showed her all. I was just, like, with my right hand, I was like, right side. It looks like this, and it's uh, so the brow tines had these three kind of gnarly points that came off the front and so then when i ran into earl down down to this lake uh right before i killed it he I was like oh it's the same one and he just held out the yeah. three fingers and uh yeah so you could tell and then when Corey and i were on this moose and it was through the thick brush i was 
I thought the smaller one was the one I was looking at behind it. And so I figured the other one was the bigger one, but of course you have to wait till you confirm it. And, uh, but Corey was about 10 feet to my left and he turns to me and he did the same, like three fingers sticking out. And so I was like, okay, good. And then when, of course, when it stuck out, came out, I made sure it was the one, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. You get that nonverbal and you know, these people so well, like you spend so much time up there, you get these like nonverbal language down, you know, it's kind of like the, the twins when they're young. I, I wonder, maybe you guys know, do, if it has a weird configuration, like that one that you passed off that maybe you thought you saw the shed and it has maybe some funky thing and it drops that, dram, drops that antler, is it going to grow that way again the next year or is it going to I, I grow think, differently? I think year after year they're kind of, they do. They just might get bigger for a while and then they start shrinking back down again because we get older moose and so you know we're bigger before, but. I think they get a lot of the same configuration, but I'm not sure about the brow ties because I got one a couple of years ago that was six by five. Yeah, there's and there seems to be up there. Um, you'll get the the lower paddle with the brow ties, like like the one Earl shot there a few years ago, which is really really nice. And then you get these bowls that are, you know, I've seen them up like in the sixty inch range that basically. Predominantly, we'll have a couple of big spears. It'll be two by two on the brows, and they're they may be eighteen, twenty inch long spears. Um, those guys are ready for real business. Um, and I bet you, we don't know because we don't follow them around that. I I imagine the ones that got the lower paddle with all the brow tines continue having those, and uh, the gene pool that has these spears. That's another group. I don't know. Yeah. And it makes sense that we don't see a lot of the four, you know, this palm style brow tine around because if there's four of them, then you can shoot it when it's 40 inches. Uh And we've seen a lot of, or we used to see a lot of younger moose that were, you know, 40 inches with this kind of palm style get taken. And then you kind of, since the, based on the rules, that genetic pool doesn't compete as much. And yeah, so, so now, point, so yeah. now you end up with a lot of two and three brow tine area bulls that genetically always have two or three brow tines in our area. And so you rarely, I haven't seen a four brow tine in our area in for That's, a long, long time. You bet. Yeah. Well, it's been a while. I mean, that one I got was kind of an anomaly. I was literally six by five Yeah, yeah. For, for that area. That's. It's, I mean, you, you get over to other areas, I think over maybe over towards um, uh, um, into the Prima 13 over there around the Denali Highway. Uh, maybe you get more. But what, what I've noticed from even 30 years ago up there is these um, big bowls that um, don't have this five or six. Um, so, but, you know, to your point, um, if the gene pulls being uh, decimated somewhat, if you do happen to have four brow tines, uh, pretty soon you're not going to have bulls with four brow tines. They're going to be different. Yep. And so, mm. Yeah. It's just amazing that you, you know, all the big bulls are those two, two brow tines. I mean, by, mine had three and two, but most of them have two and two. Like that big bull on the way out, that was a two and two. two. Uh-huh. Yep. Our, our biggest bulls have been the ones with the, uh, two and two and um um that they're still nice big they'll they'll be tall and um it, it, these um fighting tines is all i can say is i'd rather have a couple of those yeah it yeah. would be gnarly to yeah. fight against <laughs> yeah. i mean yours would be um compared to these these two moose we got there yours would be a nasty guy in the fight where mine's uh more uh, he doesn't have that stuff. He had some big tines down there. So. Yeah. But who knows? Wait. Now, um, as you guys go into the same area year after year, do you ever get the inkling or the want to try a new area or try a different style hunt? Um, you know, as I get invited to go to maybe someone's moose camp and people really want you to stick to, you know, that same area, or if you're going to commit to a family spot, 
you know, you go year after year and there's got to definitely be some advantages to being in a certain area and knowing this is where the moose travel, this is where they normally pop out. But you guys going to the same area for so long, do you ever feel like I'd like to try a new spot or do you not want to give up the spot? What's your thought process with that? Well, um, I'm just going to, let's say, 25 years ago, I thought, let's go at the Denali Highway. So the uh, Jack and Jerry were younger, and we went up there. We had some caribou tags, and uh, we got some caribou, and Jack got his first moose there. It was a nice 50-inch. Um, the next year, we over near Talkeetna, and we got a, a moose over there, um, and it was it was a nice moose. It was 62 inches or something like that. It was a nice moose. But... Um, um, right now, I guess for me, and uh, you know, I asked Earl for his comments more about setting a comp- comfortable camp and the fire, and uh, a little drinking, maybe some whiskey and some cider, and having good. I, it, I would say it's a camping trip with a little moose hunting thrown in, yeah. and it's kind of like, like John says, when when we hit that second hill down into that valley, it's like we're coming back. Okay. So we're, I won't say home. We're, we're coming going, back to our coming ranch. Home, we're com- we're yeah. coming to our camp, There's some right? nostalgia. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, while it would be exciting to maybe go see something else, um, it's not about killing the moose. It's about, you know, us being able to camp, having the other guys come in. You know, it's, it's, it's more about the comfort of being at our camp. You think that's an age thing? Maybe. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. I used to chase a lot of different hunts and different things and stuff like that. But now it's it's kind of a comfort to come in there. We know where the moose most likely will show up. We kind of know the drill, and we can relax a lot more. So yeah, I, went, I mean, when I first started going there with these guys, and I was all gung ho, new, you know, and I was out hunting all day, and chasing stuff with my bow and all. Now it's more. Jack will tell you. You know, we're not so <laughs> I'm I'm happy to let Jack and, and Corey and the young guys go out and, and go spot all day and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that that area is so beautiful and so unique. And when you know, John and I'll sit there last year we had the most amazing full moon view that we put the scope on that was unbelievable. It's things like that and the northern lights and the Milky Way and all that. So the wolves howling. Yeah. So Yeah. You know, if we were to go hunt to Yukon and we're sitting on a mud flat somewhere in the middle of alders, I don't, I, you know, could we get bigger moose? Yeah, but would it be that much fun? I don't know. Yeah. So, and. Yeah, I, there's a, a picture here. I don't I think you need to somehow include this. It's um, the one with that burning sunset. Oh, yeah. And your moose horns in it because uh, when you see that, Daniel. Um, I've been looking at that view for 30 years and going, I just love this. I mean, yeah. I don't, I really don't need to go anyplace else. Yeah. You get everything out of that area that you, yeah. that you want. You bet. Yeah. yeah. So, Here in the wolf pack. Yeah. You know, the stuff we see, we know where to look for the bears on the hillsides and yeah, you know, it's kind of a comfort food. Well, here we are here. <laughs> Good. Got, yeah. Uh, right. Sun. Oh, wow. You yeah, hear it. So. You got this burning sunset. You got the moose. Um, um, I'll have to make a note about uh, our, our friend Jim. He passed away a few years ago. Right below this moose is a, a bog, and this is probably about 10 years ago. Um, he had a medical problem one night, and uh, he wakes me up early in the morning. John, John, have a urinated all night. I've got a big problem. So um, we... We, we tried to address it. I did have a sat phone and uh, um, called some medical people, my wife's medical. I asked her what she thinks. And uh, and so we figured we got to get him out of there. So anyway, um, Jim liked doing things off of Craigslist, even though he, he, he did have money. He, so I tried to find him a Craigslist helicopter ride out, and that didn't work. So I went with the state troopers and Anyway, um, we had medevac land right on the other side, those moose horns down there. <laughs> like 20 yards. Yeah. 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 And so he had a, uh, a prostate that was swollen up, and he couldn't urinate. And uh, they landed down there and drained them. But um, 
as they took him away from the spot here, I got this picture of I'm holding up the moose horns out here, and there goes Jim. And Helen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the quintessential moose uh, moose yeah. camp photo. Yeah, it's a good one. The helicopter race, and John's holding the horns. Yeah, and see you, Jim. Jim's in the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so then at your first aid kits had a catheter from that day on. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, we yeah. told Jim, you got to learn how to use it. I'm not going to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> it was always the, uh, the, the, the uh, fear of catheter training, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, just to add a little bit about, like, why, why we like to, to go in here, uh, why I like to go in here, and uh, maybe, like, intrude a little bit on them. I know these guys. I've been fishing and hunting with them for a long time. I've been hunting with, them, of course, my dad since I was a little kid. But uh, these guys work harder than anyone else I know to go do awesome things like sheep hunting, the way they fish, the way they hunt. And this spot is not an easy spot to hunt. This is a very hard spot to hunt. There's, t we've talked about before, there's tons of features, it's high brush tons of predators this is where you go to go moose hunting when you want to make it as hard as possible on yourself and so you're on this awesome camping trip but you have to fucking work your ass off you have to know your shit and uh it makes it a lot of fun and it it may it makes it challenging like when they are when they had already got the moose before he went in it was kind of like oh well where's the challenge you know it's going to be fun to go camping but where's the challenge and this is this is the spot like we if it was an easy spot where you could see every bull that walked through the valley i mean these big bulls will be here for a week we won't see them you know they come out out of the timber at nighttime they come out of this thick brush that's above our heads at night you know at night if you're out there and it's um <clears throat> full moons clear skies for a week you're you don't have these tiny little windows for the bulls to be moving around that you're going to spot them so that I think that challenge draws to why we like moose camp a little bit. At least it does for me. Um, and the other thing is, you know, even though I've been hunting with my dad my whole life and been here hunting with Earl for a while, um, I learn so much every time I take a footstep with them. Um, it's just the way that they do things is so much different than I do. And, uh, you just pick up on that. And Corey, the whole, Corey is an awesome hunter. I um, mean, and we've been hunting a long time together and, uh, but he, every time he goes out with Earl or my dad, it's like, we're sharing stuff that we had learned. And so there's that draw is like, I get to not only hunt with my dad, but I get to hunt with Earl. Who's a, a super awesome, the you moose, know, moose whisperer, whisperer, right? The moose whisperer. <laughs> um, it, and we're getting to learn from these guys and yeah. that's stuff that like I get to pass on down to Pax and pay when they come. You know? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's one of those deals where uh, we talk a lot about on this podcast about being, you know, Alaska rich, whereas you're not like rich as in money, but you, you have your, you have your ocean boat maybe. And you, and you got your, your fishing spot where you go get your salmon all the time and you got your trout hole you go and, and maybe you have a cabin somewhere and, and you have your moose hunting spot, you know, which is like a cherished thing that growing up in Alaska is something that you eventually want to get to. You know, I mean, growing up hunting with my dad, we didn't have a, a place to go where we would go every year and this was our spot and we'd try different areas. And I feel that that's something that as as a family man and I have two sons at home, it's something that you want to to have an experience for yourself and for your children as well that you can pass along down to them. And it's one of those things that once you finally find that spot, you know, you want to hang on to it. And I think that's, it's so cool. And, and it just adds another one of those check boxes on an Alaska life that you live. And it just kind of completes the entire, the entire circle. And so for some of us that don't have that spot, you know, it's something that we're still striving to do. So you go and try this float hunt or you go try this new area until you finally find that area where you're like, this is enough for me. And this view is what I want to see for the next however long and yeah. you want your children to mm -hmm. see. Is that yeah. hit, hit it on the mark maybe? Totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's just so much fun too then starting to share it with Jack coming back and Corey and some of the other guys, right? The younger 
I, I still consider myself the younger generation, John. You're getting older, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> having those guys come up and then, you know, knowing that it's going to be kind of somewhat past, right, to the next group. Yeah. When we yep. can no longer make it when we're 90. The, the yeah, first time we early. came up here 30 years ago, the uh, gentleman that um, came in here in the early 60s, and uh, um, he did come up with this, and I think he was 70 that year. And um, it was great to have him come in and listen to the stories of the 60s and 70s and um, <laughs> even the 80s because we came in in 90. So, uh, um, you know, it was, there was a pioneer back there. He shared it with some folks. Um, and this is just one little spot in Alaska. There's thousands and thousands of thousands of little spots like that all over out there that have their own story. So. Um, it's, it's nice to kind of just share that with you, you guys here. So, yeah, that's beautiful. I think it's, it's just, it's like a goal, you know, if you're, if you're into the Alaska lifestyle, you know, to, to find that river that you really like to go down and, and fish every time or that hole that, you know, and when you have a kid to show him and, and that moose spot, I mean, that's just, I feel it's just such a beautiful tradition mm. to pass on and, and you, you hope that one day you can pass it on. And, and I'm sure you can't wait until the day that Jack brings, you know, packs it and pay mm -hmm. down there to, to show them all these things that you showed him and, and all these little footsteps that you've taken that now, you know, the next generation is going to walk down and, and eventually who knows where that leads to. That's just, it's just amazing. I don't, I don't have to stay in good shape to do that. <laughs> Just tell you what, this is, a, this is a, you know, we got up there, two old guys got that moose this year. We go, why do we do that? <laughs> well, pretty soon you'll just be the guy that just cuts the outside with the chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Clears the land. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming in and, and sharing your story about your, your area and your hunt and your tradition and the history that you guys have and the knowledge that you guys have that, you know, as us as young men and, and newer hunters are striving to learn and, and hopefully anyone listening to this, you know, can one day find their spot, you know, that they can grow and eventually make nicer i'm sure every year like oh maybe next year we're gonna add this mm -hmm. or you know now we have the arctic oven and now we're gonna add the you know the wood stove and we're gonna have this and that and just to make those like little comforts a little bit better mm -hmm. knowing that you're going to be going back there for as long as you can yeah so. what's going to be next a hot tub <laughs> yeah, they're pretty <laughs> damn nice right now. <laughs> Sauna. Well, Riggsy was showing me a picture of their his dad spot, and 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 they got a heated shower, and they take their pack rat and go down and fill up that thing full of water oh, and use that to like heat it up. So <laughs> oh. so you, you got a goal there, uh, Jackie, to to get the shower, the hot shower in there. I think I, I want a sauna before a shower. Well, I know guys that have designs on on you know heat tubes and, and little water pumps to make hot tubs on, you know, rafting trips. So yeah. yeah. Well, it's doable. Pretty nice. <laughs> I did think that one little uh, thing that you have on the side of the wood, the stove that heats up the water. Oh, oh yeah. That was a really, that's really cool. Yeah, that's just a simple stove from, from uh, Sportsman's Warehouse, but that's, that thing's great. Yeah. And that little hot water sidecar there, you yeah. know, wash water and stuff. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. We really you appreciate bet, you guys coming out. Hope everyone enjoyed that. And uh, stay wild, Alaska. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you. You remember my speaking to you of what I call your overcaution. Are you not overcautious when you assume that you cannot do what the enemy is constantly doing? The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. The Bait Shack. Located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge, can't miss the bright red shack. They are the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Lawn Pro AK, your year-round professional property maintenance company, providing services such as weekly lawn maintenance, driveway sweeping, snow and ice management, and tons more. Get your free estimate today at lawnproak.com. 
Anchor Town Dogs, located at 4th Avenue across from the old 4th Avenue Theater. Look for the blue and gold umbrella. From reindeer dogs to bomb euros, they've got you covered. Anchor Town Dogs, your local gourmet hot dog and sausage cart. Menegados Accounting, locally owned and operated advisory and tax accounting solutions. Passion, experience, diligence. Learn more at menegadosaccounting.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off Arctic and 58th. Handcrafted Alaskan made cider. They also have a tap room downtown on the corner of 5th and E. Check them out at doubleshovelcider.com. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska. Built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation. Find their products such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce carts, and more at the Treehouse AK and other dispensaries around the state. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. The TreehouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway. Your all-in-one cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be high performing and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women or pregnant or breastfeeding. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services. Helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com.